So I think a lot of people in this room have had the experience of being the only woman in the room, um, maybe so often and for so long that you stop noticing it. Um, I think this is going to be a very fun panel in which we talk not about how you get up to the top of an organization, but instead how you change the organization by virtue of being there. Um, to start us off, we have a truly incredible woman, Gabriela Ramos, who has occupied some of the most uh, senior positions in the Mexican government, including Director of Economic Affairs for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and a top advisor at the Office of the Minister for the Budget. She is now OECD's Chief of Staff and Sherpa for the G20. Gabriela. Thank you, thank you, Ellen, and thank you uh, again, everybody and the panel. I'm very pleased to be here uh, talking about another angle on how to promote gender equality. I think this is a very important topic, as you said, not only because uh, it allows women to be there when decision makings are being taken, it allows uh, women to be uh, seen as decision makers, and it allows to project role models that are important for uh, uh, for the society to see that it is feasible, is possible, and is actually uh, very important to have us uh, there. Uh, I have to say, just think about uh, how many countries in the world uh, would have kids asking whether uh, men can also be presidents, like Germany. And I think they will need to wait for another term. Uh, but this is the kind of, of impact that you have when you have girls and women in the leadership position. Um, it's also an imperative, uh, not only the moral imperative, but also the economic case. When we uh, reached the gender target in the G20, we found that 100 million women could get into the labor force, and this is also very important in terms of the performance of our own economies. At the OECD, we also have a recommendation on leadership and position for women in the, in the, uh, leader, in the leadership roles, and many countries have adhered to this recommendation, but progress are, is very slow as everywhere. On average, and I have to say on average, and this average run from some countries having 10%, and the Nordics, as usual, having 50% or almost equality, uh, but we have 28.7% of legislative seats, we have 293 of ministerial positions, we have the private lagging behind, 20% on boards, women on boards, and 4.8 CEOs, which is really very, very low. Um, how to do it? I would say affirmative action, and I know this is controversial in some countries, and some people might say, uh, as uh, the president of Congress in Mexico told me once, because they have a quota and they have achieved 40%, uh, 50% representation, it's, it's amazing, in Mexico. And he said, uh, but quotas are bad because many incompetent women will reach these positions. And I said, don't worry, because many incompetent men reach those positions without a quota. And so what difference would it make? It's just having more incompetent people around. But the, the truth is that we need to be very careful when designing those quotas. I think that we want organizations to thrive. We want public sectors to really deliver what they need to deliver. We, we want the best and the brightest. But sorry, when the conditions are very unequal, you need affirmative action, and they really need to uh, break up the speed at which we are reaching equality. Um, in 2016, nine countries of the OECD have quotas on boards, and I have, to, I have to say Sweden, Belgium, and Italy have 30% women on board. In politics, 13 out of 16 countries use quotas and reach 30% representation in Congress, uh, but we still know that this is a very slow progress. Uh, we have some of the people here, Mathilde Menard, who uh, runs uh, the, the Director of, uh, of uh, Financial Affairs, uh, and the OECD has also the G20 corporate uh, uh, governance principles, where we say go for quotas, go for voluntary arrangements, go for targets, go for support systems, go for whatever, but you really need to have more women taking leadership role. And I think that is gonna go help us also to transmit and to encourage girls to be seen as, as someone that can participate, to be seen as someone that can bring diversity to the discussion, and to be seen as a strong person and to gain confidence. Because this is the other area that the OECD has been uh, uh, assessing, how much girls have less confidence. We have seen it in schools, because they are not encouraged. So what about changing, as I said it in the last panel, 
the media images that we send about women and having more women taking decisions and being present. As Prime Minister Trudeau so said in the G20, let's be real. Let's have more women in this table. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gabriella. I should um, confess before we even begin that as we prepared for this discussion, um, talking a little bit about the notion of feminine leadership, uh, a, number of, a number of times we kind of came up against the question of whether there is such thing. Um, and in some cases, discomfort with, the, uh, with even the term feminine leadership. Um, so, the, the women who are going to investigate this question today are, um, to my right, Helen Durham, who is the Director of International Law and Policy at the International Committee of the Red Cross. Um, her job includes, um, most interestingly to me, dealing with, uh, with non-state military actors known frequently as guerrillas or terrorists, um, and negotiating over uh, over combat zones and weapons, um, an area where you don't necessarily see a lot of women in positions of power. To her right is Meka Brunel, who is the CEO of Jacina, the fourth largest real estate trust in Europe. I would just like to repeat, the fourth largest real estate trust in Europe. Meka was born in Tehran, got her degree in civil engineering, and came up through the testosterone-soaked construction sector um, to uh, occupy the position she has now. And to my left, um, and I'm really looking forward to hearing from her, is Marlene Schiappa. She is France's Secretary of State in charge of uh, gender equality, um, but she became, uh, she rose to prominence as a, as a writer and a blogger. She wrote uh, Maman Travail, uh, Mom Works, I, a subject of great interest to me. Um, she's written 15 books, and she, um, I would sort of summarize your job as waving a red flag in front of the bull of patriarchy. So anyway, um, we'll just begin with a few questions. Um, the, the first one I, I'm going to direct to Helen. Um, and the question is this, you know, the area of defense and security is one that has traditionally been sort of impregnably male. Um, but at the current moment, um, women are the defense ministers of France, Germany, Luxembourg, Sweden, Netherlands, and Norway. So, so the question is, how has this come about and what does it mean for the world? Well, thank you. I think what it means for the world is that people in positions of authority have woken up to what we all know in this room, which is that women have formidable capacities when it comes to analysis, decision making, and e engaging in leadership and vision. I think though what is genuinely interesting is that it is more of a male domain. I mean, I've spent 20 years of my life engaging in training all parties in conflict on the laws of war. And I do think that there is a taboo that we're almost moving through. I think people for forever have been concerned, and rightly so, about women being hurt and killed in conflict. But it's quite interesting that, that society today in these countries is able to absorb the idea that women can be involved in, in, uh, in war in an active way, in issues relating to targeting. So I think what it says is perhaps we're moving to another era. I would like to say, though, that part of our philosophical discussion about the idea of women leadership is the, the fact that I look at my 12-year-old daughter and I hope that when she's growing up, she doesn't find it astounding, that it's not a topic of conversation that these women hold these positions. But I think we're at a time where we need to analyse and understand what, what is society saying and where are the comfort levels. Another question I'd like to ask you has to do with, um, with projecting power. Whenever you take charge of a group of people and when you, especially if you're leading a large organization, somehow you have to establish yourself. You have to project power. And, um, and let me ask, you know, as a woman, how do you project power and do you think women do it differently? 
That's a big question. I think we can only speak for ourselves, and this is one of the joys of a panel like this. We can speak honestly amongst each other with the energy of the room and, and the support. I must admit, being the first woman in the position I hold in 150 years of the institution's history, the thing that I feel is that when you walk into a room, you do get acknowledgement for your authority, but you have to create it. You have to identify your power. And I do think in some areas, men walk in with assumed power. And perhaps as women, in, as I said, as we move on, we have to prove ourselves initially. So I also think that gives us the capacity to be authentic to ourselves. And once again, I think that's an area we need to move through with women leadership. You don't need to be more masculine than a man in a male-dominated area to wield power, authority, and make changes and influence. I think we can move through that prism that we have to be put in a box, that we're women in a masculine environment, we have to be masculine. So I think we're moving through. And to me, authenticity, being able to be vulnerable at times, not all the time, but be able to say, we made a mistake, it didn't work, let's try it again, permission to fail. I think these are things that are perhaps in some ways a different style than traditional masculine style, but I know many men that, that work like that as well. So I think every discussion we have here tonight might need to have the footnote, I'm a good lawyer, I love footnotes, that says this is about some women and some men, um, because if we speak didactically, I think we're doing our daughters and our sons a disservice, but I think this capacity to be authentic, to speak and connect with human agency is something that at least I think has elements of good leadership. Mika, let's be completely honest. Do you think there is such thing as a female style of leadership? Well, again, as you said, let's be honest and talk about ourselves and what is our experience. Um, well, like if you want to go back to your 12 years old daughter or to my three daughters who are mothers now, because I'm a grandmother. So um, I think that um, like when, when you have your kids first time, whether they are boys or girls, you don't consider that they have a handicap because they are female or male, right? But so I think but there is a female leadership because I think that uh, we have learned from the way we have been managed as a woman, and probably we don't want to be managed, we don't want to, we don't want to replicate exactly the same scheme and to manage exactly the same way we have been. We are learning from, from what we, ha we have been through. And I think maybe because of that, there is some sort of leadership. Having said so, though, we are educated the same way as these gentlemen are. We are most of the time have exactly the same thinking about what should be done or not. And we probably have almost the same type of you know, um, toolbox to use for how to do, do it. But probably we are much more concerned about listening to each other the right to fail and the permission to fail and to do the wrong things. And you know what? Most of the time what I have observed is that men would come to me and say, look, I'm sorry, I, I have an issue with my kids. I need to take them to the doctor. Can I go home a little bit earlier, whatever? Or they're sure they're, what would they won't do, I mean, with their male you know, colleagues, probably it's a, it's a, it's the, uh, the fact that I'm a mother. You're talking to me as a grandmother, my baby, today, by the way. So let me run a kind of distasteful statistic by you. Um, the Gallup organization every year asks people about bosses, what kind of boss they want. And every year, the result shows that, women, that people, both women and men, prefer male bosses, um, right? So that gap has been gradually closing, but it's still, um, so 46% of people don't care. 36% of people prefer a male boss, and 20%, a rather discouraging statistic, prefer a female boss. So why is that true? Can I be blunt? Hmm. By the way, I'm very impressed to be here, happy to be partnering with the Women's Forum, just to say. Um, like, this is a silly question. Actually, for so many years, we have been managed by men. And so probably, you're right, men and women answer the same way, but they don't know what is the other way of doing it. The same way, do you want to be, you know, do you want to be managed by a short person rather than a taller one? Do you want to be managed by a left-hander rather than a right-hander? I'm sorry, but the question is stupid, according to me. Maybe this is not the answer you were expecting. 
so Marlene, let me ask you, do you think that as, um, as women rise through major powerful organizations, including governments, that they are in fact redefining what leadership is? Actually, I don't, but I will be less short. Uh, I was yesterday at the premiere of the new Tony Marshall's movie, number one, maybe you saw it. It starts and ends at the Women's Forum. And it's really interesting because you see how men can get to have power with brotherhood, with sometimes manipulation. And I truly believe in sisterhood and in sisterhood at the power to in order to can lead other women at the power. But in that movie, Tony Marshall says, sisterhood is not a religion. It's not about having faith on it. It's about doing it. And doing it is what's really hard. And that's why, because I believe in sisterhood, I'm having a fight, another, against the world little in the mass of women. Because I actually think women are always using the word little. We're always hearing, I'm having a little project, a little team, a little ID, and this is <laughs> my little card. And I just want to say, ladies, stop saying little. Say, I have a project, I have an ID, I have a team, or maybe I have a great project, a great ID, a great team, and that's what I think it is about. And how does this all fit in with what you're trying to do in France? I mean, what have you been able to, in, in the time that you've been working in your position, what have you been able to, what observable effect has there been? Actually, I think in France too, but in the world, women suffer persistence of sexist stereotypes. Their looks are watched, their families are watched. Do you have a husband? Do you have children? And we are judged on the way we live, not just by what we are doing, but about how we are, how we look, and how we are in our private life. And I think it's really a difference between men and women. Can I, can I add in on that? Because I was trying to reflect on women leadership, and I was trying to think, what are some key elements that you could draw out that make it a little different? And I, I do think that women leaders are, perhaps at the moment in, in time, more curious. We're curious about each other. We're curious, we want to find out. I don't, I have two male deputies and I have only men reporting to me and I don't hear them say, how do you get on with life? How do you balance work life? Whereas a lot of the young lawyers that I engage with uh, ask questions. So I think there's something about curiosity that I, I, I'm not saying it's good or bad. I think it, in, in a way it makes us flourish as people. I think it does then allow us sometimes to have judgment um, that we have to be really careful about. I think we also have to acknowledge not the elephant in the room, but the sense that there can be women in senior positions that have had to fight so hard to get there that they're more in a fighting spirit. Now, we think we have to have empathy, but also understand that just because you have a woman boss, it doesn't mean they're going to be empathetic. So I think it's this, this nuanced understanding, which I think relates back to that question about where um, the intersectionality that was discussed before, we are more than just our gender, we are also our culture, our personalities, the, the role we play. But I think this issue of curiosity and wanting to understand and learn, I mean, the whole room full of incredibly fabulous, curious women, if I put it that way. I mean, what, what an extraordinary thing to have people who want to understand and learn from each other. So I think curiosity and hard work, damn, Hard work. And a friend of mine said to me once, it'll be, it'll be all squared up, Helen. It'll, you won't have to fight any harder once we have incompetent and lazy women in leadership positions. And, uh, you know, it was a little bit before what was said, I'm not sure I want the world led by incompetent and lazy women, but any woman leader I know works so hard. And that's something we need to reflect on in how we give an inheritance to our children. In fact, I, w I was just going to say that I, um, I've, I've now started to think of hard working as a, as a bit of an insult. People use it a lot as, to refer to me, and now I'm, I'm a little bit tired of being called hard working uh, because that's not the same as being brilliant. <laughs> uh, 
maybe we can say we can we can say that we are hard workers because we are hard workers, because we are passionate, and we love what we are doing, what we are interested. And there is nothing wrong with women being passionate. We are not just here to do the wrong, do do, do the hard work for the sake of this gentleman. Which, by the way, I would like just to say to to emphasize something. Jacina is the first and has been rewarded, uh, Madame. You, um, you rewarded our chairman because we are the best in class company in France, listed company with 50% women, 50% men at the board level. And this is the only company with this percentage at the board level. And I would like to pay a tribute to our chairman to have done that. And a couple of our uh, board members are in the room, uh, which I would like to say hi. Um, but I think that this is also about the, uh, the men considering that they need also uh, they need also to pioneer and to push forward and uh, to be very volunteer to do something. I mean, uh, a couple of years ago, I have been called by a company because, because of the Copésium Herman you know, law in France. It has been expanded in some countries around France. And the chairman of a company, in, in, not in France, but in another country, called me and said, look, we are looking for a lady to be an independent director at our board. Well, to be honest, we um, don't really need a woman, but this is about low and our image. So anyway, we're going to, somebody said during the launch today that uh, the, uh, these gentlemen are suffering from being put aside and give a little bit of room to ladies. They are not talking about how, how we feel, you know, we could have felt bad about not being part of the show from a long period of time. So I would like to say that uh, as um, Napoleon would say, uh, a very great man, French one. Uh, behind any successful man, there is a woman. I think behind any successful woman, there is maybe a man. And we can also say, say and consider and, and, and um, emphasize that too. So I think this is about how volunteer we are to give a chance to the diversity. And it's much more about diversity, not only men and women, but how we are going to create. You were talking about curiosity. What makes you know a company or an executive committee work is the diversity of people who are member of this you know, committee or member of this organization. And from this diversity, we can create something together and make it work. And the diversity is also about you know, your origin, it's about the color, it's about, I don't know, I said left-hander because I'm a left-hander, that's why I, I'm insisting on that. And, and your experiences in your age and whatever. And this is what makes today very special and all of us, we need also to continue to, to uh, encourage people to go to that direction because this brings a lot of you know, opportunities to the company to improve the, the quality of their leadership and the way they are managing their, their collaborators. And they are, they are attracting talents because it's all about attracting talent uh, ultimately. You would like, in the competition in which we are, you need to attract the best talents. And for doing so, you need to give, this is something which came up from our launch today, give them purpose, why we are doing things. And probably this is what this diversity will bring to, uh, to the table. But I'm curious to ask all of you sitting up here, because you all sit on top of very large pyramids, whether you think it's part of your job to advance women beneath you. Because when I thought about it, the answer honestly was, was no, I, I never have. I've never made it my job. Should it be? I think you said behind every successful woman there is maybe a man. I personally think behind every successful woman is herself and maybe the help of other women. Also, you're right. I, I, do, I do see my role as um, helping make a pathway for other women if they choose to. Um, and sometimes that's complicated because sometimes if we're to be honest, it's almost overwhelming trying to carry what we're carrying. And sometimes I look and I think it is important uh, to try and support, not necessarily overly aggressively, but to find ways to be able to demonstrate that you can find these balances. I think the role of men, I, I happen to have a fantastic husband that I, I don't believe I could do what I did without him. But I have extraordinary female support and I mean even today at this forum there's networks of women that are being established to help to help the sort of work that we do in the International Red Cross and this means a huge amount in these dark moments when you're facing human darkness and you actually know 
it is a cake and go and there are people that believe in it. So I think there is, um, there is sometimes a role to do that. As I said, I think we sometimes have a disconnect where at a high level of leadership there may be women, but I look below me and it tends to be a big gap and I want to fill that gap if that is possible. But I also think that we're, we're individuals and we need to be able to find ways to take the pressure off ourselves and take the pressure off each other, as I said. And that goes back to the kindness principle. Um, so I think somehow there's a balance there, personally. This is, uh, just, just uh, jumping on that point, um, we have at our executive committee 40% of women, including me, and uh, we hired recently a very talented woman coming from a very large, the, the first, by the way, largest, so we are the fourth, this <laughs> one. She's coming from the first largest uh, real estate company in, in Europe, Unibuy, Valérie Brité, uh, just to name her. Uh, and she has joined us in charge of all the, the office portfolio. And, and it's not just, you know, helping people to hire them to be on the, on the side, you know, responsibilities, but on real responsibility when they, they can carry it and, and, and be capable to do it. And she also, at her level, has also promoted a couple of very good people in the organization to be in charge, a couple of good ladies, which were put aside. This is just about giving confidence to our daughters, to our, to our colleagues, to our friends. I would like also, I mentioned that when we prepared this session, to emphasize that there are a couple of initiatives uh, women are becoming more and more um, smart about how to organize themselves. Uh, 20 years ago, a couple of women in the real estate industry uh, created together a club, which is Cercle des Femmes de l'Immobilier, and they created this club just to, uh, g just to let us know each other. We were you know, attending some beautiful exhibitions, but we were put aside. Nobody would talk to us. Those gentlemen, we had a couple of friends, but they would never could talk to us. So when we have created, when this club has been created, uh, a, the, at the beginning, all these gentlemen would say, okay, it won't last because there is no sisterhood and they won't last. They will, you know, they will end up, you know, fighting against each other. They are women, it won't work. 20 years after, 20 years after this initiative, today there is a very large club and guess what? Many of these gentlemen two years after the creation of the club, would come to us and say, look, can you introduce me to your friend? Because I would like to know her. She's working in some organization, and she would be helpful. So we are much more smarter than maybe before and not influenced by what we are supposed to do at some point. So there's um, I was I was thinking about Matt. I mostly have just managed small groups or small teams, but there, but there was always a a kind of a, a thought I had, which is that you can, um, as we were discussing earlier, you can get a lot done if you're not really worried about taking credit for everything. That is, um, if, if, if that doesn't matter, you can really elevate the people around you and you can actually have a much better end result. But it strikes me that if I were in a Fortune 500 company, that that strategy of not worrying so much about being out in front of my projects uh, might actually be um, be a mistake um, if if in fact you're in a truly sort of competitive uh, competitive environment. Oh, go ahead. Well, I remember when I was a young delegate doing my first missions into the field, visiting people detained, talking to the military. I had um, my boss at the time tell me, "Helen, you can get anything done if you don't care who takes the credit." Mm -hmm. And at the time, I thought that's very wise advice. These are burning humanitarian issues we want to deal with. Um, but I, I do think it comes back to your, which is a beautiful, it's almost a poem, your word about the word little, petit, if I remember correctly. Um, so I think there is something to reflect on in that. Um, and it depends on your industry. It depends on where you are. I've spent a lot of my life where the work you do in the field, it's what I do in negotiating with with the militaries, with governments, it's only connected to my colleagues who are working in the field. So I, 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 I think if anyone saw of my colleague Marion, and I know what she's doing, I'm doing it at the global level, and, and so it's not about who, where I'm positioned, and you can get further done. But I do think there's, there's something about women being able to not use the word small, and to not feel embarrassed when actually they're doing things that are incredibly extraordinary. So that's, that's I think, um, something to really reflect on. Yeah, um, I think, well, uh, you know, it's, uh, as you said, 
women are most of the time they consider they are not legitimate to take the credit of what they are doing. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of years ago, I was attending a, a, um, a, a panel in New York, and, and there was a lady, you know, coming, you know, specialist on behavior, talking. It was a it was a women forum um, made by a large company in New York. And she said, she, she, she was from New York with a be very beautiful New Yorker, you know, uh, vocabulary. And she said, you know what? When you have two persons, you know, at year end uh, review, and you have a woman and a man. And so you have the lady and you tell her, well, you have had a great year. You did great. Your objectives are absolutely, you deserve all the credits of what you have done. And you're going to get a great bonus. Uh, if I just want to say something for you to improve in the next year is this little thing. So she will leave the, uh, the, uh, the desk of her boss and she will say to herself, oh my god, I screwed up everything. This is not the right thing to do. I am not the right person. Why didn't I, did, why wasn't I perfect? I hate the word perfection, really, personally. And then the guy has exactly the same review with the man and says, look, you have been a very bad year, it's a disaster, you didn't achieve, accomplish your objectives, you, you are not, you are very badly rated, your bonus is divided by two, and the guy step out and say, I don't know what he has, maybe something wrong with his wife. So <laughs> it's uh, all about that. Don't feel guilty about what you are doing. I'm not saying that whatever we do is right. In my case, it's not the case. I do a lot of mistakes. But not consider that we do not have the right for forgiveness, uh, to, to, to fail, and to be forgiven. And it's, it's the same with, with, with men. Of course, I'm exaggerating. It's a little bit of a, But I think that this is important to understand that there is nothing wrong. We do, I mean, sometimes people ask me, how comes you are in charge of such a, such a large company, listed, whatever, 500 people, and you are a mother and a grandmother, how you can manage? They never ask a man about that. I mean, I don't know how I can manage. I do my best. I, anyway, a bit of everything. So I think it's much more about how you can find your balance, don't feel guilty, and do what is the right thing. And you have the right to fail, and you have the right to be forgiven. I suppose my, my last question, uh, which will be sort of opened up to everyone, is um, there are two words that have been kind of, that I've been sort of mulling over uh, because I heard them recently in, in my own organization. And one word is diva, um, and the other word is high maintenance. Um, and the reason these words are preoccupying me is that I, I'm not sure what you call a man who is a diva. Um, which means someone who, I think, advocates for themselves in a muscular way or, um, or speaks up when they've been overlooked. Um, and I guess I wonder, at what point are, are those words going to be abolished from the workplace? It's a really interesting linguistic question. I don't know what you'd call a male diva. A guy. A guy. A successful guy in a suit or something. I don't know. Um, I, think, I think that puts the finger on a very critical issue. How do we make sure that we have authority, that we do what we need to do, that we're, we are, as I said at the start, formidably intellectual, but also we don't follow paradigms that perhaps aren't necessarily the positive ones for society? How do we move forward where we learn the best and use who we are? So I think that um, going forward, I, I think we would really should have a little campaign. No more, no more word of the diva in the, in mm. the, in the workplace um, and no more little. We're really cutting into the language. We're going to be cut with only a few words left. But um, I think it, things like that, if you raise that with your colleagues, if um, I'm going to take it back to my team and say, because it starts thinking, it starts people reflecting on how do we attribute the same sort of behaviours through a different prism of what's acceptable? And as it goes back to what I said at the start, what's acceptable for a woman to be engaged in and what is not? We have to move through that prism. And for the last word, we're going to turn again to our fire starter, Gabriella. Thank you. Thank you. 
No, well, I, 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 I want to uh, congratulate you. I think that this has been a very inspiring reflection. I have to say that I was not prepared to be listening on how women exert their leadership. I was thinking that we were talking about how to get more women in leadership positions. <laughs> but I think that it's interesting because it denotes that women are more conscious, self-conscious, when they have positions to fulfill. Because I have never heard men in leadership position have the kind of reflections that you are sharing with us now in how you, you go for authority. You just that get, get there and they just do it. So I think it's very important that we have this kind of approach. I have to say that leadership, women in leadership also are very different. We cannot idealize women in leadership. They are authoritarian leaders. There are criminal leaders that are women. There are corrupt leaders that are women. So let's not idealize it. But women that are really trying to move agendas that the ones that you are trying to push is very interesting to listen and to, to understand how you do it. I would nevertheless put the finger on having more women in leadership position. And I would put the finger on something that you mentioned, which is what is the responsibility of those in leadership position to bring forward the rest? Nothing more depressing than hearing leader, uh, women in leadership saying, I'm not a feminist. Why? Why are you ashamed? Yes, I am. Who cares? If you have a connotation that you don't like it, well, that's your problem, not mine. How about bringing more women? I have been blessed because at the OECD, I am the chief of staff. I don't take the decisions of hiring and firing, but I'm very close to the leader. And I'm always there to say, oh, do you remember that in equal circumstances do you prefer Lee? And then I think we have made progress. We need to keep that in our mind because I think women are shy to help other women because they took so hard to get there that then it becomes more complicated. And we need to remind uh, 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 how to create the conditions for women to go for leadership position and how to remind men that they need women to take decisions. I was also proud in when the inauguration of the uh, gender equality system in Mexico took place with the president. I said, President, you're making a lot of things to get women in leadership positions. I just want to ask you for one thing. Whenever you're taking an important decision, turn around and see that there is a woman there. Just as simple as that. I think that will help us a lot. And this is something that we also can take home when we do things together. Thank you. Thank you.